Horowitz and Patsik and John Galley were all like top notch scientists on this exact presentation for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. This is a novel view of how things fit together. I won't say that it's airtight, but I, I expect it will make sense. So we live in a time of paradox. There's widespread recognition of human caused climate change, massive investments in renewable energy, but globally CO2 is increasing at the highest rate in history. We have a 12-year flat plateau in conventional oil production. The price is still in dollars a barrel. For 90% of people in the US and Europe, growth ended a decade ago. Yet the stock markets are at all-time lows. Everyone's worried, but no one talks about the real issues on TV or in public. We also have a time of myth. Oil demand is going to dry up in the next 20 years due to self-driving for taxes. We'll begin manned space colonies by 2030. The global economy will be growing at 20% per year by 2060, a real comment by the World Bank chief economist. We will grow our economies, mitigate climate change, and solve global poverty and inequality using solar, wind, and smart grid tech. Humans will be extinct by 2025. Uh, I'm glad you all laughed at that watching the video. Uh, a time of questions, what should we be doing to make the future better? Uh, it's my opinion that in order to come up to appropriate answers, our first and most important task is to come up with the right questions and framework, which is what I've attempted to do here. And none of this should really be a surprise to you, uh, but we'll see. I've never done this lecture to my students before, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Some brief review of key points on energy. Uh, you all know by now that energy underpins natural systems. There's a energy investment and energy return in nature, and that dictates uh, what is possible for biological organisms, including humans. In our world, in our economic systems, every single good and service that's measured in our economic uh, production first requires an energy input. Economic growth is then highly correlated with more primary energy added to human systems. The reason, one of the reasons this isn't totally recognized is from 1970 to 2000, we became more efficient at using energy. And so it looked like this relationship wasn't quite one for one. But since 2000, it's reverted because our, our technological efficiency improvements on power plants and things like that have, have become much smaller. So the, the relationship between energy and GDP is incredibly strong. And you guys know this because... Uh, you know how much embodied energy is in a barrel of oil. Uh, you will also, the astute among you, will notice that in September, when I presented this slide, I had one tenth of a horse next to my label, and now I'm one ninth of a horse because I've been so busy I put on 15 pounds <laughs> this semester. Uh, so hopefully next year that'll be one eleventh of a horse. But, anyways, <laughs> the amount of oil, uh, the amount of energy in one barrel of oil, to after conversion losses, 700 kilowatt hours of work. We do six tenths of a kilowatt hour per day of physical work. So that equates to four and a half years of human labor in a barrel of oil. The average human in America, not the world, the average American consumes 60 barrel of oil equivalents per year, which equates to inside the body, we eat five or six Big Macs worth of calories a day. Outside of the body, we eat, eat 407 Big Macs per day. If you can see the relationship between energy and GDP or wealth on a log graph, power consumption here, logarithmic, and the annual GDP or income, and you can see there's an incredibly tight correlation between energy and income, energy use. Another important thing that we learned is there's a huge difference between price, cost, and value. The price is what we pay at the pump. The cost is what the energy companies have to pay in energy and dollar terms in order to extract uh, natural resources. But the value is something that we don't pay attention to at all. I mean, how much value is a barrel of oil for what it can accomplish? We don't really think about that. So the single largest flaw in economic theory, and I just sent you a 60-page document that Monday that shows another dozen flaws or so. Uh, but the single biggest flaw in economic theory is we've got this fossil magic that took tens of millions of years to heat, comp 
compress, refine under the ground. Mother Nature did the work for us. The flaw in economics is that we only count the cost to pull it out of the ground. We don't call, count the cost of its creation nor of its pollution in our economic systems. So this leads to our society um, views things through solely through a monetary lens. Remember Ted Patsick's uh, lecture, a lot of natural resources follow a Gaussian shape. And that Gaussian shape can be extended because then you have a new technology or then you add Alaska to what was previously just continental United States. The natural resource extraction follow roughly a Gaussian shape, where the exponential monetary economy follows a different shape. So we're following, as a nation, as a species, the flat curve, when the reality is more like the red curve. The reason we did that is down in this period here, all the curves look the same. We had plenty of cheaper stuff, and uh, there, these things were abundant. So what this leads to is a massive increase in human uh, wealth, especially in the last two centuries. World income per capita is 14 times what it was 200 years ago. America income per capita is 49 times what the average human had 200 years ago. And another reference to Tad's uh, graph, if you add up the average American caloric footprint of 220,000 kilocalories per day, we, each of us, in this room, 325 million people divided by our x pools per day, are the metabolic equivalent of a 30-plus ton whale. So we also learned that energy, uh, there's a good and the bad and the ugly. The good is that energy provides us brain services. It makes us warm when it's cold out. It makes us cool when it's hot out. It gives us food, it gives us shelter, it gives us medicine. So that's the good. The bad is all the nasty stuff that humans do to each other or to other species with this extra exosomatic wand that they're waving around. That's a picture of the shark fins that they just lop off the shark fin and throw the rest of the shark back in the ocean as one of the countless examples. But then the, there's the thing that we can't notice right away which is the ugly, which is the biogeochemical metabolic influence of our activities on the oceans and the climate, uh, which isn't really noticeable day to day, but now we have scientists that can tell us that there's this, this other impact. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about how all this stuff fits together. So this class really can be summarized by these three uh, um, circles. We, the blue is the biophysical foundation of the economy, energy, materials, uh, non-renewable resources. The purple is uh, uh, that we are animals and we have common ancestors and a trajectory that led us here. And so there's a science-based template of human behavior. We're not a blank slate. We come uh, equipped for prepared learning when we're born. And then the environmental impact, that not only are we doing these things and consuming these things, but we're making a an impact uh, beyond our own sphere and beyond our own generation. So uh, at the London School of Economics in 2008, Queen Elizabeth questioned, why did no one foresee the timing, extent, and severity of the global financial crisis? The British Academy answered a year later, the psychology of denial gripped the financial and corporate world, the failure of the collective imagination of many bright people to understand the risks to the system as a whole. And that is what I'm doing in this class. I'm trying to give you a description of the whole system, and then you will first understand it and hopefully uh, incorporate it into your worldview, your careers, your families, uh, towards uh, doing things of meaning and maybe doing things better in the future. So again, this was a graph I showed the first day of class that we've got a four-sided cage with a mouse in it. If you leave any of the four sides open, the energy economy piece, the environment piece, the human behavior piece, or the synthesis, which I'm presenting today. If you're missing any one of those sides of the cage, the mouse escapes. Uh, and the reason I, I have this is there's a lot of people working on climate change, and there's a lot of people working on energy, and there's a lot of psychologists working on how to be happier with less, etc. But it's the whole picture um, which is the most valuable, in my opinion. Okay. So today I'm going to present my thesis that modern human culture functions as a superorganism, uh, and then give some conclusions and implications 
And I'm going to end today, since this is a little bit of a sledgehammer to the head, I'm going to end with a few minutes of suggestions on what to do, uh, which we're going to unpack in detail the last three class sessions. So this is just a little bit of a glimpse into what you think about these things. Okay, so you all remember this, that um, energy seeking in nature, organisms and ecosystems in nature, cells branches branch out and then the leaves come out from there so as to access uh, the maximum surface area exposed to the sun. Uh, so we can test something called the maximum entropy production principle, uh, shows that a thermal scan from above a forest, that the coolest areas are the ones with the largest trees, the oldest growth biological organisms. The warmest areas are those areas with no biological things growing at all, like so what's happening is the more mature biological organisms and ecosystems are better grabbing the sunlight and therefore dissipating the heat. So nature has gone towards an energy gradient, which is the sun. Okay, so human behavior. You're all familiar with this character by now. Our minds can look forward, but our feelings come from what worked in the past. So we talked about ultra-sociality, the fact that humans, like ants, bees, and termites, are an extremely social species. Um, we were social in tribes not much larger than this class and the next class combined for 290,000 years of our species history, and around 10 or 12,000 years ago, we started to uh, uh, sedentary lifestyles where we would stop in one area and start to grow food and generate surplus. What we generated then was actual physical surplus, grain in most cases, which we could then store for rough periods, but we could trade with other tribes for something that they had and we didn't have. Um, so that was a, a major transition in our ultra-social social species. And another major transition was when we discovered these incredible, powerful fossil workers that crawled out of the ground a couple hundred years ago and started to aid our industrial processes, freeing up uh, human labor, giving us higher wages, higher profits, lower price stuff, and more people. Um, so you all are familiar with this by now, that sexual selection and relative fitness apply to humans as well as other animals, because yep, humans are animals too. Um, I think I showed you this picture last week, maybe. This is Tiger Woods' yacht, and that's uh, his ex-wife, uh, Ellen North, and his new wife, or Chris's yacht. And we, we do this at all scales of our lives. We compare ourselves to others. Unfortunately, in our generation, we're comparing ourselves using pecuniary, physical, material things. And it doesn't have to be that way. The comparing is who we are. The measuring in terms of exiduals and physical stuff, not necessarily. So we, we strongly care about relative versus absolute uh, metrics. But this applies not only to comparing ourselves to others, but comparing ourselves to ourselves. Uh, you remember this chart that shows that dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter leading to reward and motivation, spikes not when you buy the shoe or you buy the new car, but when you get the signal to buy something. And then you do some work, and once you buy it, then your dopamine recedes, and after a very short period of time, you're left for craving something more. Um, how many of you know you're getting an A in this class, yet still want to beat your last quiz score to do better than you did before? Um, it, it's very uh, prevalent to be competitive with our own baseline. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. So if you consider the agenda regime preference checklist, and we, I think I showed you this a couple months ago, would you rather be 10 degrees, 65 degrees, or 110 degrees? Would you rather be poor or rich? Do you want zero children or greater than zero? Uh, if you need to be in town in two hours, you want to drive a car or walk? Would you prefer to win a war or lose a war, etc.? So if the, the agenda of the gene, the default, if we're not using intelligent foresight, is almost all these things require a larger energy use. Okay? So there's something in psychology and uh, physiology called homeostasis. And humans, as biological organisms, like to stay in physical homeostasis. If we're cold, we need to turn on the heat. 
If we're roasting, we need to get in the shade or turn on air conditioning. If we're starving, we need to have food. All these things lead to caloric uh, uh, input. Our psychological needs don't necessarily need energy. But in our society, a lot of them do. Our the little server farms that are powering my, my gadgets and, and the trips to the Bahamas for three days or, or whatever. Um, so the composite of these ends up being highly correlated with energy. If we pair this with time bias and our sleep discount rates, the fact that we significantly care about the present over the future, we want brain services, we want them today, not next week, next year, or next decade. This uh, is a picture I took last week. This was the guy that, uh, Matt, you remember Phil. Um, he drove me to the airport and his Tesla didn't have enough miles to go to the airport and back to his house because it's 90 miles each way. So we had to stop for 30 minutes and get a 30 or 40 mile charge at this free place where you can get a charge. But think about the emotional efficiency of all of us pursuing that. From one vantage point, it's amazing that we can drive to the airport in, in, a couple, in an hour. That's awesome. But to stop off for a half hour just to get enough charge, the emotional efficiency of I want to hurry up and get to where I'm going because I want to watch the Packer game, or I'm really hungry and I got to do these emails. So the emotional efficiency of behaviors like this is, is not automatic. This was a necessity for us, but most people don't choose things that don't give them the immediate feedback uh, of the psychological homeostasis. Okay, now we're getting into some economic stuff. Um, so, you guys all know this by now. Banks do not loan money, they create it. Since 1971, there's not been a single currency in the world with a link to physical resources. So, that's a problem. Uh, when the green line, our energy and low entropy uh, materials, high quality ores, are gradually declining. And when money is increasing. Christine, are you on your phone? Ah, taking notes, plus one for Christine. <laughs> um, so we don't think of it this way, but when we take on debt as a nation, as a company, or as an individual, the debt someday has to be paid back with energy. So this is a, a chart uh, that you should understand, so the, the experience of the United States is our GDP was growing pretty correlated with our debt for a long time. So we would add one and a half units of credit to generate one unit of economic growth. But then that started to slow and we started to go to debt more and more. So in this period, we had three units of credit to generate one unit of economic output. But China took our model and just went exponential. So until 2008, they were adding two units of money from thin air to generate one unit of GDP. But since 2009, the global financial crisis, they're adding six units of money that the Central Bank of China just injects into the system to generate one unit of GDP. So this is not sustainable. Um, so the laws of economics were written during this period. And now we're approaching this period where our monetary markers of what reality is are decoupling from that reality. Okay, so I'm going to have a series of slides now that are a little bit economically wonky. Don't worry about uh, the actual details. And in any case, you're all done with quizzes in this class. Um, so you remember the, uh, the underlying graph is the different energy sources of our world the last 200 years. So up until the 1970s, if we think about the amount of energy that global human cultures use, it's represented by this, this blue spigot. Uh, so up until the 1970s, we continued our physical world expansion, adding vertical land productivity <coughs> uh, to replace what we had previous horizontal productivity. Horizontal productivity is we're going on the horizon and we're planting crops and stuff. Vertical productivity is we're digging under the ground to get fossil sunlight and adding that to our system. We ran into two energy crises in the 1970s. Then we went to debt and trade productivity. In order to keep our energy access growing, we went to debt as a way of pulling resources forward in time. 
and globalization as a way of accessing cheaper areas of production and more cooperation, this part of the history hit a wall in 2008. Then we went to the Central Bank and Government Guarantee Bureau. Since 2008, central banks and governments responded with temporary, but they're still there nine years later, too big to fail guarantees, quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates, balance sheet expansion to maintain our population's access to brain services. And the brain services are correlated with energy. And now we're in this kind of uh, limbo stage, which I call Orwellian productivity after George Orwell's 1984, where ignorance is strength, war is peace, uh, and we're making rule changes. Um, for example, with Italy, uh, two years ago, made prostitution and cocaine sales legal and added to GDP because they had to keep the GDP to debt ratio below a certain limit in order to get the European Central Bank guarantees. Uh, new tax and benefit schemes and numerous other abstractions allowing us to continue growing the energy spigot. Okay. So if you think of the head as the size of the economy and the straw as the amount of energy that we're using in each period. Hold that in your mind for a second. So the straw is the energy and natural resources size. This lower diagram here is a cross section of the straw. Okay, so we look inside the straw and look at what is pushing it, what is expanding the straw. Uh, I would argue it's a bunch of things. It's cheap energy, uh, there's two types of technology, which I will explain in a second. Um, there's money or cheap credit, there's government rules, and then there's the number of nodes in the system, which is correlated to the population. Okay, so this is review for you again. Um, there's basically two types of technology. Technology type one is we're adding huge amounts of fossil energy to do things that humans used to do manually. Uh, technology type two is we're making systems better, more efficient, using less energy or designing new uh, energy technology. Uh, currently, in, when, in the world of technology, this type one, which is finding more ways for humans to use energy and give us brain services, is dominating human technology inventions, and it increases the total demand for energy worldwide. Okay, so the impact on this spigot the green means it's kind of organic and can be continued. So organic growth of global energy spigot was based on cheap energy and uh, inventions in technology like power plant efficiency or a new find of an oil field or something like that. These factors are now smaller than they used to be. What's larger is these, these non-repeatable, more risky factors. So we're creating money from thin air in order to access, uh, give populations access to energy services. Uh, governments are being uh, changing the rules, and we're, we're developing lots of new gadgets that are, are, are energy sinks. So if you think about um, how this fits together, some things in our society push the size of our economy, the size of our energy spigot, larger, like $10 barrel oil, for example. Other things pull the size of the energy spigot larger. All of a sudden, if there was a helicopter over Minneapolis with a billion dollars that was created yesterday from a printing press, that would pull consumption forward because we would all leave this class and go grab it and get $10,000 and go buy some stuff. The same amount of stuff existed before the helicopter came. So this is kind of what's, what's pulling our, our demand forward. So if you look at the cross-section of the straw maybe 30 years ago versus today, the components in it that are red, meaning they are more risky and not permanent, are increasing. This is what our paper is going to be about, is quantifying those things. So another thing that I haven't really talked to you about yet, but I think is relevant, is the number of nodes in a system is relevant to how much energy it uses. But nodes don't increase geometrically, they increase exponentially. So if you have 10 people, okay, and everyone has a relationship with everyone else, there's 45 possible relationships. The general rule is you take the number of people and square and divide by two. So it would be 100 divided by two is 50, but the correct answer is 45. But if you triple the number of nodes to 30, it's 30 squared is 900 divided by two. You all of a sudden have 10 times more connections. And this is what's happening with globalization and more population 
is the number of connections, each requiring a little bit of energy input, um, is, is increasing. And as you know, uh, population has significantly increased. So the outputs of the superorganism are energy-based, and the inputs increasingly are rule-based and abstractions, like debt and, and some of this other stuff. So we have energy seeking in nature, like a tree, and then in human systems. It's the net result of seven and a half billion fire aids, each individually pursuing an internal optimal foraging theory energy marker algorithm, put out of the mouthful, cooperating and assembling into groups, corporations, and nations uh, in an energy hungry metastasis uh, planet wide. And it looks like this if you, uh, I'm sure you, well, you guys just read that, that uh, overshoot book. Um, the planet is, you know, a giant networked energy machine. So if I rearrange this puzzle, um, it ends up looking like this. And my belief is that our species is de facto functioning as a superorganism. This has two main inferences, and the implications will be at the end. The first inference is that naturally, like uh, Grace said at the beginning of the class, we assume that bigger and larger equals more able to grasp and envision complex events. This is a carryover from our ancestral past where we funneled things in a group of 20 up to the leader who could then assimilate things. But the truth is that a single human cell, a kidney, a, a person, a small group of colleagues, that once we get between a person and a small group of colleagues, we actually get dumber um, as far as in our ability to uh, um, assess and react to complex events. And the ability for individuals and small groups <coughs> to understand the materials we're talking about in this class and to make change in the world is actually much higher than it is as a nation level or a world level. So the number one conclusion here is that behaviorally, Global human society is functioning using simple tropisms akin to a simple amoeba. In other words, the larger the group, the dumber it gets with respect to complex plants. The second uh, and perhaps more disturbing implication is that physically, global human society is functioning like an energy-hungry heat engine. So when we talk about gross domestic product, GDP, it would more aptly be called GDB, where the B stands for burning. Every single product in your household Every single thing in this room that we've purchased emanated from a small fire being burnt somewhere on the planet. And yes, as we go to renewable energy, that fire might get a little bit smaller, but it's a fire nonetheless. Okay, downstream in the superorganism, we just had the uh, environmental section, so I won't go into huge detail on this, but up to 200 species are going extinct every day. Humans and our livestock outweigh wild terrestrial vertebrates 60 to 1. Uh, we're causing unseen impacts in the ocean and the biosphere. And these things are downstream of our brain services decision. They're a byproduct of us choosing to get these energy services that are somewhat necessary for our body and somewhat culturally approved. Okay, synthesis. <clears throat> the main implications of what I'm terming super organomics is that the human amoeba is the invisible hand, the market that's optimizing profits by each corporation, small or large, aggregated globally, is the invisible hand that's pushing us forward and making all the impacts that you read in that book. So back to this trophic pyramid that humans um, take primary energy, natural resources from nature, we process them with technology into secondary capital, which are goods and services. And then we have tertiary markers, uh, which in the old days used to be gold, and now they're digital electrons and, and bitcoins and things like that. But our trophic pyramid has, has dramatically changed. As a global culture, humans are no longer maximizing surplus. We're maximizing surplus value. We're maximizing representations of physical surplus. And our human trophic pyramid has become misshapen. If we look at this one pyramid down here, we have we use half of our low entropy um, fossil magic. We've turned it into a lot of stuff, but increasingly more goods and services. 
as I've mentioned a couple times, there's more bartenders and waitresses in America now than there are manufacturing jobs. And we have this bloated financial sector uh, representing it on top. Point number three, uh, and this is highly speculative, but this is my opinion. Uh, economic theory wasn't chosen because it was true or valid. It was chosen and used in the service of the superorganism heat engine in order to get these brain services to as many people as possible. This is a chart of long-term uh, growth. For much of the last 2,000 years, we were in flat or declining periods. All modern economic theory, the laws of economics, were invented in that little square. So all the elite people and decision makers in our world are expecting the black line because of the flawed Cobb-Douglas function that ignores uh, energy as a main input in our economies. I got on the phone today with someone in Europe and we're trying to rewrite the Cobb-Douglas function. What I really need to find is a young, 30-something, kick-ass econ professor that wants to help with this because I'm not going to be able to have the gravitas to do it. It's got to come from within economics. But I have a dozen people that are helping me shape that because economic theory just treats capital and labor as what matter. But both of them are dependent on energy. There's an energy theory of value underpinning our society and it's ignored. And you all probably know more about that than the average economist at this point. So the point here is there's no credible institution or government body or corporation globally that is specifically planning for an end to growth, despite growth being over 80% of the people in Europe and America, uh, as measured by uh, take home pay. And I have a slide coming up on that. So politically, our system is not broken, but working perfectly. Moving away from the rich feeding grounds of fossil productivity is not in the job descriptions of high ranking humans. Neil, would you concur with that? Neil concurs, okay. Um, so as long as human cultures maximize GDP, or GDP, efficiency and better technology may extend the runway of this stuff, but they're merely going to build a larger global heat engine. So we talk about renewables. I think I've showed you this, this graph already. Renewables are growing smartly. They're growing very fast. But if you look at the absolute amount they're growing, versus the absolute amount of fossil fuels growing, they're still growing smaller than fossil fuels. So we're, we're still building this bigger aggregate heat engine. And all the negative stuff that we read about last week, the mass extinction, and metabolic impacts on the uh, planet's biogeochemistry are downstream effects not easily willed away or solved uh, by changing prices. An important, very important part, uh, which is a little complex and threatening, is the main way we're accessing brain services today, globally, um, is via the credit markets. This is a correlation of the uh, blue line is how much each year we raise the size of our economy. Um, growth. And the orange line is how much we increase our debt in order to raise our economy by that amount. So we continually raise the size of our debt load in order to keep consumption going. So this shows um, the blue is the United States debt. The red is China debt. The light blue is the emerging markets outside of China, and this is the rest. And we massively increased global debt uh, over the last 15 years, but it's starting to slow. Why? Because we're becoming saturated. The global ODCD the nations presented here are 330% debt to GDP. So whatever our GDP is, our debt is 3.3 times that. It would be if you were making $50,000 a year and you uh, owed $165,000 to the bank at that time. So what we've been doing in this context of the superorganism is we don't want to tighten our belt. The right decision would be, you know what? We're living beyond our means. Let's tighten our belt. Uh, but instead, we kick the can and we increasingly kick the can with these less sustainable um, methods until the can is blocking the road. Um, and, and, and now what do we do? And especially what do we do if the can starts rolling backwards? So my opinion is we're going to keep this dynamic rolling. We're not going to change this by voting or by being knowledgeable. Um, we're going to keep this. This dynamic will happen until it can't. 
And then we're going to respond to what I'm terming the great simplification. Now, um, we've talked about a probability distribution in this class, a probability distribution of the future. This is Nate's view of the most likely scenario for economies in the developed world out to 2050. But even if it's my base case, it's still only 30, 35% likely in my head. So there's a lot of other possibilities. This is the most likely. But this is intense, if you understand it. It means that in the next 10 years, there's going to be a financial recalibration with underlying reality. And that this, the, the total size here is the size of our economy. So if the average American today makes $53,000 a year, adjusted for inflation, they'll be making $35,000 a year or something like that. So it's, it's a massive change in what has come before because of our kicking the can down the road. Okay, conclusions, implications. Have I shown this graph on the left before in here? Uh, I guess not. So this shows, um, I need to update it. This shows the different quintiles of income of Americans. Only the top gray line, which is the top 5% of Americans, are making more after inflation than they did in the year 2000. All these other demographics, including the bottom 20% least income, people in our country who make the least income, are more than 10% worse off than they were 15 years ago. This is why Trump or Bernie were going to win, one of them. Because both of those guys were speaking to this issue without explaining why it was, but they were speaking to those people. But no government in the world is preparing for anything other than this. So this is the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund. The black line is the actual growth of what the world happened. And all, every year they come up with a new report on the growth forecast in the future. And no matter what happens, they revert to their kind of 3% growth in the future. One of you, I forgot which, um, talked to your economist teacher about these issues and asked what will the growth be this century? And the professor said 3% through the year 2100. And then the student said, well, what about 1,000 years from now? And he said 3% through 1,000 years. Um, yeah, there'll be some recessions, and the economy will look different then, there'll be more information, but 3% growth. You all know that 3% growth, the whole size of the thing doubles in how many years? 20. 23 and a third years. So this is a physical impossibility. Um, and yet, that's what we're preparing for. What's happening seems like it's somebody's fault. You understand our tribal natures. It's the liberals. It's Trump and the Republicans. It's the Middle Eastern people. It's the tree huggers. It's the rich. It's the Chinese. We blame others for something that is ecological and energetic, uh, and biophysical in nature. Viewed from the perspective of the superorganism, we're all complicit, but no one is to blame. What's happening is largely because fossil slaves are asking for pay raises at a time when the amoeba is larger and hungrier. Um, this pisses people off in California. Um, the vast majority of pro-social people are working on what we think should happen as opposed to what probably will. Um, so the good news is our physical needs require energy. Most psychological needs do not. After the superorganism splinters shrinks, there will be new models of how humans receive our brain services. But we have to understand who we are first, which is something that you guys have a leg up on in this class. Um, simply put, I did show you this graph before. This is a recent survey online that showed you think the next generation will have more or less of the same amount of income as adults do today, and more people than not said less, less income than today. Same survey, will people have the same quality of life, happiness, well-being as they do today? Same sort of thing. More people said the last quality of life. The tenets of the last few weeks in this class, I think I would argue that this is now unavoidable, that people in this country and most of the world are going to have less physical throughput uh, in the coming generation than we, what we have now. This is, a, this is avoidable still, very much so. In fact, for a lot of people that are making six figures in America, they're freaking miserable. And a, a cut in their salary will free them up to do other things. 
there, there's lots of possible pathways that we can make this uh, a higher quality of life. You guys have seen this chart many times now. This is energy supply uh, per capita on the bottom chart. This is the Human Development, Development Index, which is a wide uh, ranging statistic on prison populations and longevity and health and medical care and happiness and all these things. And after we get uh, our basics met, there's very little increase uh, from more and more stuff. I also showed you this before, that um, people in Guatemala, nationwide, the average income in Guatemala is under $8,000, where in Kuwait, it's 10 times that. Yet the happiness level is identical in those two countries. There are plenty of examples in the world today that 10 to $15,000 average income for people, as long as most people have around the same, people are not only fine, they're living meaningful, happy, healthy lives. So when we come back to this, from the topic from Monday, the economic inputs to the worst of the climate models are delusional. Um, fossil fuels are likely to quit before we fire them, but will that suffice and will the cure unprepared for be worse? We're somewhere between those two stars. The problem is, and this is why my friend Neil and I continue to talk about these things, there is no natural champion within the superorganism to address these risks. Um, okay, so next week we're going to talk about um, why people aren't doing things about this, and then we're going to talk about what might happen, what won't happen, and what could happen, uh, and, and kind of a view of the 21st century possibilities. But I'll just uh, go through a little bit of stuff. I'm not going to read this, but I'll send you guys the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, so what is not likely to happen? Growing the economy and mitigating climate change. Growing the economy by replacing fossil fuels with renewables. Humans en masse choosing to leave fossil carbon in the ground because that means we have less brain services. And I just think the odds of us voting to keep the carbon in the ground are the same as me going to Vegas with a quarter expecting to break the bank. Politicians explain limits to growth before limits to growth are well passed. By the way, art drawing on the left by one Miranda Edwardson, sophomore reality student. Uh, so, what things would work if we um, Given the unique constraints of an energy seeking, metastasizing, dumb superorganism, what, what would work to combat the challenge that I've just put up? Well, one would be a benevolent dictator. That would work. Some person like Matt Griffiths or Stahl ruling the world and making ecologically sound decisions that everyone else had to follow. I don't see a way that that could ever happen. So I'm knocking that off the list. Radical amoeba wranglers that wrangle the system down. The system is so fragile, though, that any wrangling might cause the results of the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, to avoid the ugly, what might make the bad really bad. So I don't think that's really a viable option. Global governance and mutual coercion mutually agreed upon is also unlikely given these dynamics. I think the most likely thing is the amoeba at some point with all of these little straw-widening uh, developments, it's going to run out of food. And then there's going to be a recalibration, and then we're going to prepare, react, and chart a new course. So I think we need a completely different conversation. And I have this odd uh, uh, analogy here of Harvey Weinstein. All the bad things that he and all these other men did, people knew about them, but they were afraid to say things about them they were worried about their status or their reputation or, or whatever. But they knew they were wrong and they knew they knew for a long time. In the same way, we kind of know that we're way over consuming, that we're hurting the environment. And people are kind of afraid, especially in the media and, and other places, to come out and talk about these things. I think we are ready, close to ready, for a completely different conversation. And the conversation is going to be, this century, we're going from Sperm whales to orcas to uh, river dolphins, metabolically, you know, something in that trajectory. That sounds awful. But we have to keep in mind, if we think about USA GDP per capita, what our average income is per American citizen, a 30% drop, which is what I think is going to probably happen before we 
guys are 35. Um, at least a decent likelihood. That brings us back to 1992 in per capita income in America. A 50% drop in our goods and services and our income brings us back to 1971. Okay? Not pleasant on the surface, not a disaster either, and probably good in a lot of ways. So, I'm going to conclude with some suggestions, and we're going to talk about this a lot the last week of class. So the lenses with which you view the world, the lenses with which your roommates and the people in your fraternity and sorority and the people that you're at the library and the cafeteria with are kind of the media lenses of unicorns and rainbows and electric cars and the future is going to be Star Trek and things like that. The simplest way to change your lens after taking this class, I'm not asking a lot. The simplest way is keep the happy glasses on. Do your career, do whatever you're going to do that you're passionate about and that you're good at, but avoid the consensus trance, think for yourself, be skeptical of wild claims, and just be, as Joey would say, woke to, these, to this reality. You know, just live as if you're aware of this other story. And for those people that that's the route they're going to take and they take nothing else from this class, you can kind of be a sleeper for seven years from now, nine years from now, when these events start to unfold, you know what's going on. And you've already psychologically processed it. And you can take a leadership role in your community, at your job, or whatever you're doing. But there are other lenses that I'm going to suggest that you possibly wear. One is, you can't help but take this class and go out and see the amazing energy stuff that we get the brain services we get from energy. So instead of looking at the world with money lenses, you might start to look at the world from energy lenses. So some suggestions on what to do with the energy lenses on is you simplify your life first and beat the rush. Don't become overly reliant on energy intensive activities. Don't buy a 7,000 square foot house as soon as you can afford it. Don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend in San Francisco because the flights are gonna be like prohibitive as, as some examples. Help to relocalize supply chains, something I've been talking uh, to Neil and McKnight about uh, funding and doing. Learn a physical skill. You guys are all the, the, the brightest of your age. Don't forget to have like one skill that you know how to do that's physical, whether it be in cooking or fixing a lawnmower or growing potatoes or art or music or, you know, have, know some physical skill uh, that you have. Um, I have very few, but I have. Help to design technology that provides basic services for the future as opposed to short-term dopamine gadgetry. Uh, there's a massive list of societal transition projects that we're going to need to have, have happen and campaigns tackling all parts of this challenge where energy and growth become more scarce. Uh, one, one example, I, I, one thing I'm going to be working on with the team in, in uh, Switzerland is after this recalibration of the superorganism, uh, more based on our underlying resources, is instead of taxing people, instead of taxing labor, you tax the resources. Not only energy and fossil fuels, but all resources. So you shift the burden of the tax to the actual resources themselves, and therefore if you make 50 grand a year, you get 50 grand a year. But if you're gonna buy this thing that was previously $180, it's now $400 because it was taxed because it was resource intensive. If we did that today, it would crash the system. But if we did that in the future, I think that is a sapient way to, to go forward. Okay, so in addition to an energy lens, we have a behavior lens. You guys know that we evolved from simpler organisms, that we evolved from our successful ancestors on the Pleistocene. There are some Pleistocene hacks that I'm gonna to suggest to you in a couple weeks. Here's a brief uh, overview. Be happy with absolute wealth instead of relative. Know your brain. Understand your brain so you can control the cage match in your own mind by throwing red meat to those modules that need it from time to time. Control some aspect of your life uh, and the controlling, uh, being in control of something as opposed to not being in control reduces cortisol and stress hormones. It boosts health of T cells, which boosts your immune system. So control some aspect, especially if if you're scared about something and things are out of control, control something. Um, take electricity, technology breaks, reset your brain and nature. Uh, Haley, have you done that since you took this class? Yeah. Good. 
good answer. Uh, I, I think that that's really important. We're going to talk. We're going to talk more about that. And, and choose your tribe wisely. Uh, who you hang around with, their philosophy, their ethic, their intelligence, the things they care about, whether they're woke or not, that has a big. Um, uh, is there some pejorative? <laughs> that term? Because every time I say it, people laugh. Is that, is, is that a naughty word? Or yeah. No, it's just funny because you didn't know what it was. And oh, now no, I like... never heard about it until Joey said it. So choose, <laughs> choose your friends. Choose who you hang around with uh, wisely. Another lens is this is a species level conversation we're having here. Okay? We are the first generation to know who we are, where we came from, what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we really need the impact we're having, and what our, our assets and, and, and liabilities are. So this is a conversation for some of you that will continue through your whole life. We need system steering activists influencing the long-term bottlenecks. So there are 5,500 remaining mammal species on this planet. If one in a thousand humans dedicated some aspect of their life to be a protector or an advocate for that species, each of those species would have 12,000 people working on their behalf. As one example, if that could be structured and organized. We need a beyond 2100 ethic akin to a new religion, and we need a completely different conversation. So those three lenses are ones I would suggest that you may put on from time to time after hearing all this. But then you can take all the lenses off and have a conversation with yourself. Who am I during these times? What do I stand for? The time is not to minimize my impact. It's okay if you want to be a vegan or drive an electric car, but that doesn't mean that you're saving the situation. I would rather you eat cheeseburgers every day and drive a Hummer and really impact the future of St. Paul, Minnesota, the Midwest by your actions than the converse. Um, understand that this statement is true. My species is not evil. We are complex creatures capable of great things, both terrible and wonderful. And I think this is kind of the core part of this segment. You are all part of a super, super organism. I am part of a super organism, and I am not. Capital letters. I can do things outside of the agenda of the gene, ultra-sociality, energy-seeking, dumb super organism. Especially as an individual person and in small groups, I can make plans around this larger context. So the probability distribution in the future, as I've warned you guys many times, I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know what to do. I have some suggestions. The suggestions roughly fall into these two barbell shapes. We need to protect, prepare for, and direct response to physical limits in our society and our economic systems. And I think, personally, we need to own who we are as a species, as a culture, amidst and beyond the coming bottlenecks. Uh, so we do not live in normal times. The world is not yet fully broken. What is our species capable of? Brain services per non-renewable resource will be key. Knowing who we are is the first step. Caring is the second, and then there are more. We're each part of this amoeba, and we are not. Ten minutes left for questions, comments, discussion. Super, does it make sense? <laughs>